Good evening and welcome to tonight's Winston Bible study, our recharge uh, Bible study. We're focusing on discipleship. Tonight we're coming to lesson four. We want to start off by again expressing our thanks to Pastor Chet Joins uh, who developed uh, this study and this discipleship model and utilized it for many decades to grow a strong and flourishing uh, Christian family. Uh, tonight we're focusing on the disciple uh, as a follower and a learner. Uh, Chet points out that Jesus never looked to make converts, but only to make disciples, people who are following him. Uh, he commanded his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. You can find that in Matthew 28, uh, verse 19, the Great Commission. And remember, this was his last command that he gave. This was the very last thing he said. It was the mission he established for his followers to take up and to pursue uh, for all time until he comes again. Uh, it takes a disciple uh, to win and build another disciple for Jesus Christ. It is our life calling. It's what we're designed to do. It's what we're called to do by God as believers. So this uh, study tonight will aid us uh, in finding his will uh, for our lives as we attempt to disciple others for Jesus. Uh, when you're working with others, be sure to work through each question. Uh, we use our own words when we answer our questions to make sure we truly understand uh, something rather than simply quoting scripture. Uh, we may quote the scripture, but then we try to explain it to make sure that we're really understanding it. When you're able to put something into your own words, and it, it means the same thing, uh, then, then we know you've really caught, you've caught the idea. So we want to make sure those who are discipling understand what it is they're saying, not just parroting phrases, um, but we want to make sure they really understand what it means and how they are applying it in their lives. And of course, we always engage in uh, prayerful meditation as we are thinking about the answers uh, to these questions and working through them. That being said, uh, why don't we go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on tonight's uh, study. We ask that you use it in our hearts and minds to develop uh, disciples and disciplers who are honoring to you, who please you, who long to obey your word and fulfill the Great Commission in our lives. Be with us uh, as we uh, study your word and un unpack it to our hearts. Help us to understand it and to live it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The overview of tonight's study really can be broken down into four, four parts. It defines what a disciple is. It helps the new believer, the person that you're working with, to uh, see that they are a disciple. It establishes that, that they are being discipled and a follower of Christ. Uh, but then also it immediately turns to help them see that not only are they a disciple, but they are called to be a discipler. We learn about God's word, not just so that we know more about it, but so that we are equipped to help others come to know about God's word and to know God more intimately. And then ultimately it sets up a model uh, to help the disciple lure, disciple the new believer. Um, so hopefully this will be informative for you uh, and as well create a system of self-reproducing disciples. That's our goal. Before we get into the actual uh, study for tonight, one last thing we need to think about is the memory verse from last week. It was John 10.10. 10. Our focus last week was the abundant life that comes with knowing Jesus. And so our, our verse reflects that focus. Can you remember? You can pause the video and try to recall it if you need a minute. If you need a clue, uh, it starts off about the thief and contrast the thief um, with Jesus. The thief comes to what? The thief only comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I, Jesus is speaking, I came that they have, may have life and have it abundantly. Life in Jesus is meant to be full of meaning purpose and value not only uh, are we uh, we are not promised 
uh, health and wealth, as some pastors teach, but things of lasting value, things of eternal value. And that's what the abundant life we learned last week means. So the thief comes to only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is uh, what exactly is a disciple? How do we recognize a disciple when we see one? What are the marks in a person's life that indicates that they are truly a disciple? Well, John 1.37 says this, Two disciples heard him say this, and uh, this was um, John, and he's, he's saying about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, and they heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Uh, in this text, uh, we see that to be a disciple of Jesus means to follow Jesus. Now, in the context of the original passage, that was a very literal thing to do, that Jesus was a person, he was walking, and you walked behind him. You went where he went. But what does it mean to follow Jesus today? Obviously, he's not a physical person walking around that we can walk around behind him and go to the places he goes. Um, I think a good illustration, however, can be follow the leader. Um, as It's a children's game, and when we play it, the leader moves around the room, the followers follow around the room, but not only do they follow where he goes, they follow what he does. Uh, I talked about this a couple weeks ago in, in a sermon. Um, the leader may be flapping his arms or her arms, and all the followers flap their arms, or kicking up their feet, or walking backwards, or making noises like a duck. Whatever the leader does, the followers do. So when we think about following Jesus, and what does that mean, we're really asking the question, where would Jesus go if he were in our situation? What would Jesus do if he were in our situation? And how would Jesus act if he were in our situation? We're looking to do the things he does, go the places he would go, and act the way he, do, act the way he acts. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that we could say Jesus would not go to a strip club or a, a, a topless uh, bar. Uh, why would he not go there? Well, there's a lot of uh, bad things happening there. You say, well, that's where Jesus goes. Well, and certainly he wouldn't be tempted in the same way most of us are tempted, but uh, he, he would avoid uh, going places that were um, wantonly evil, promoting evil things, unless he was going there, like he did in the temple, to overturn some tables. Um, so you can't say, well, I, in, I really enjoy the drinks and the food at this topless bar, so I just go there uh, to enjoy the atmosphere. Uh, Jesus would not go there to enjoy the atmosphere. If Jesus went there, uh, you, you'd have to say, well, what would he do while he was here? How would he act? He certainly would not oogle the people there. Uh, he, he would uh, do something to uh, upset the, the status quo. So we'd ask the questions. We ask the question, where would Jesus go if he were in our situation? What would he do if he were in our situation? How would he act? And then those are the ways that we act as well. There's a great book, by the way, uh, called In His Steps. If you ever get the chance to read it, it's by Charles Sheldon. And um, it, it uh, is a fictional story set around 1900 or the turn of the century and um, written probably in the 1920s or 30s. I forget exactly. But um, he describes the life of several people who make this very commitment to do these very things. And it shows powerfully how, uh, well, some of them actually fail, which is, I think, true, uh, a good, a good um, point to keep in mind. Some, some of them don't go through with it. Uh, but those who do, it shows how their lives are drastically changed and um, how their lives are changed. It's not just a flowery presentation of uh, a fake uh, a fake sort of uh, Christianized version of life, it, it, their lives become filled with challenges um, in ways they didn't expect. It's a really powerful book, In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. If you get the chance, it's a short book. It's a quick read. I recommend it. The second uh, thing we're looking for, for the marks of the true disciple, uh, can be found in John 8, 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. 
Now here, here, <clears throat> excuse me. He uses the word abide. The word abide literally means to live. Uh, I abide, my abode. Uh, so it means to live with something. Uh, to abide, though, in this context, means more like to accept something or to act in accordance with something, a rule or a decision or a recommendation. Uh, we have the, the saying in our uh, culture, I can live with that. Uh, I can live with that. Means I can accept that. Means I won't fight against that. So to live out his word uh, means to do what the Bible says. In other words, to obey the Bible's commands. To abide uh, in his word means to obey his command. Now, of course, there is a challenge uh, that nobody perfectly obeys his commands. The challenge uh, is, of course, we fail. But I think. A true believer, the mark of a true disciple, is somebody who has as their goal obedience. It's their aim. It's their desire to obey. Uh, Chet has a great saying, um, sinners uh, leap into sin and love it. They lavish it. They just lounge in sin. But saints loathe sin and they lapse into it and they loathe it when they're there they hate it they want to get out of it as quick as possible um, they hate being in sin so it, it really shows a very different attitude towards obedience not not that the christian is perfect in his obedience or her obedience but that they want to be obedient and an unbeliever does not so these these are some of the marks of the true disciple third mark of a true disciple comes from John 13 34 a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you you also are to love one another by this all people will know that you are my disciples that you have love for one another now love may be the seem like the easiest notion of discipleship to understand I think we understand love uh, I mean much easier to understand than the abstract follow me or the abstract abide in my word or live in my word. But the real question then comes, how do we love someone? What does that look like? Uh, love involves sacrifice and thoughtful consideration of what's best for someone else. Uh, and, and then not only realizing what's best, taking the time to think about it and realize it, but then actually engaging in doing that sort of thing. So it may be the easiest concept to understand of the three we've talked about, but the hardest to actually fulfill. I mean, by nature, I would say that most of us, if not all of us, are selfish. We want what's best for us. We look out for number one. And yeah, there are times maybe when we can overcome that. Uh, and, and that's really our prayer, is that God will help us to overcome that more and more regularly and look for ways to love others not just love ourselves as you're talking with a new believer specifically about this uh, concept it may be a good time to take stock of our own lives and to ask ourselves are we really loving others i think um, discipling others is one way that we love them we're sacrificing our time and our energy um, but if we're honest and we struggle with this notion and we really examine ourselves and admit our own failings, I think it's uh, our failings, uh, failures are as much of a teacher, if not more, than successes. If we just walk around uh, highlighting uh, all the things that we do well, then uh, the only thing that new believers will um, take away from that is that Christians are flawless and they're not there yet. They'd never be there, in fact. Uh, so I think uh, letting them understand and see our failings uh, as we disciple them is important. Uh, and if we're unwilling to, to take on disciples, if we're unwilling to reach out to others, unwilling to help them to know Christ better, I mean, isn't that an indication of our unwillingness to love others? Uh, I mean, that's a huge sacrifice. And uh, Jesus says, people will know us by our love and if we're not loving them then they're not knowing him through us so uh yeah i think this is a a, a very challenging 
um, notion uh, if we take in some time and reflect on it and really examine our lives uh, we can be deeply committed um, in some of our own areas of failing and challenged motivated hopefully to um, make the transformation the changes in our lives necessary to make this a reality and of course that'll only happen with the Holy Spirit uh, sanctification of our souls and transformation from within so it's a matter of prayer as well so having to established sort of the, the foundation of a disciple, uh, some of the marks of a disciple, one of the next questions is, uh, what's in the heart uh, of a disciple? What, what do the, does the disciple truly desire? What's their prayer? Uh, and uh, our passage comes from John 3, and it's John the Baptist who's speaking. And John was very, very popular. But when Jesus came along, his popularity began to wane. He had fewer followers. His followers were leaving and going to Jesus. Uh, his, the, the, his 15 seconds of fame were coming to an end. His, his fad was passing, and Jesus was, uh, seemed like the new and upcoming star. And so John's most devoted followers were, um, were not liking this. And so they come to John and say, don't you see what's happening? Your, you know, your followers, your disciples are leaving. They're going to this Jesus guy. And John's response is just so beautiful. It's this heart of humility, this heart of love, this selflessness. Um, and he really shows uh, what it is that is the heart's desire of every true disciple. And he says this epic line in John 3.30, he must increase, but I must decrease. He willingly, John the Baptist, willingly accepts this decrease, this uh, waning of popularity, this uh, loss of influence, because he sees that Christ's influence is growing. Now, that, that may be a very scary thing for us um, if we have a, a person that we're discipling and they're getting more and more committed to Christ, uh, we may feel even threatened at times, ironically, that their faith is exceeding our faith, that their faith is growing, that they're growing so quickly and, and so much that they're surpassing us, uh, that they're reading more um, scripture and commentaries and books that are helping them, that maybe even... Uh, they're understanding things that we didn't understand. The questions that they're asking are beyond our ability to answer. Uh, and our pride would say, wait a second, I've been a Christian longer, and uh, I've got to kind of keep them as my disciple, when in fact, what we really need to say is, they've exceeded me, and they're following Christ now. They're following Christ in powerful ways that, uh, that we're now peers, and maybe even one day, they are the teacher, and I am the student, because they're following Christ more so and more completely, more successfully, more perfectly than I am. And I can learn from their example. Uh, a true disciple would praise God for that. I think uh, Satan loves to keep us fixated on ourselves, though. And uh, I think we might struggle with that. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the questions that I was struggling with is how, what does this look like in our lives? Uh, how, how do we make... Uh, more of Christ in our lives and less of ourselves. And I think this is one of the ways by, um, you know, you, you teach a bird to fly, you teach the baby bird to fly, then you let them fly. You don't clip their wings. Um, we're looking for the ways that uh, to help point people to Christ, to God, rather than keep them looking at us. And so when they look more and more to Christ and less and less at us, that's something we celebrate. I'm sure there's other ways, but um, and maybe you can think of those and share them with each other, share them with me. The next section then um, uh, talks about our responsiveness. Uh, it's really to help this new believer realize that they are called to be a disciple, and it shows what a disciple looks like. Really, this section builds a lot on the first section, uh, but it amplifies it. 
it overlaps. There is significant overlap, but uh, there's also some growth, some building in it. The first question is who truly is a friend of the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and Jesus answers that. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you to do, if you, command, if you do what I command you. Now, this is a really important point here because there's a lot of people out there who claim faith in Jesus. They claim to be a believer, claim to be a follower, but they ignore his commands. They say they're believers, but they aren't trying to do what he says. They aren't trying to do what the Bible says. Jesus here says that they are not his friends if they're not doing what he commands. You're my, you are my friends if you do what I command. And the opposite is also true. If you ignore what I command and don't do it, then the implication is that you're not his friend. And we can go through a list of uh, commonly broken commands in our day and age, in our culture, by nominal Christians. And the term nominal simply means in name only. They claim the name, but they don't live the life. Um, they, they talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. No, nominal Christians claim faith, but there's all sorts of ways that uh, it's very clear that they are not truly followers of Christ. Uh, in our culture today, all sorts of ways our cultures, you know, the Bible says this is wrong, but people in our culture say this is right. Um, Jesus says don't do this, and people in our culture who claim to be followers of Jesus say it's okay to do that. Uh, we know the majority of people live together, uh, husband and wife, before they're married. They live as husband and wife before they are husband and wife. And our culture says this is not only normal, it's healthy, and it's better. The Bible says no, it's not. The real question is, are you a follower of Christ or not? A follower of Christ says, well, Jesus says, don't do this, therefore, I won't. Um, homosexuality and homosexual behavior is another thing. Our culture says this is the right thing. This is a healthy, normal um, uh, life uh, style. The Bible says, no, it's not. Uh, there's lots of Christians out there who agree with our culture and disagree with our Lord. Jesus says, if you're truly my friend, you'll do what I command you. You can't say, Jesus, I'm your friend, but I'm going to do the opposite of what you command. Um, another thing, getting off the, the kind of sexual aspect of disobedience in our culture today, that's a big one, and you can go through all sorts of ones, but uh, Sabbath keeping. Um, lots of people say, I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. You can't love Jesus if you don't love his body. You can't love Jesus if you don't love his family. You know, how would you feel if someone said, I really love you, I just hate your family, I just don't want to be around your family, I just, uh, you know, think about a spouse, uh, a, a potential spouse, uh, a single mother has two children, and a man comes and says, you know, I really love you, I just don't love your kids, I want to be around you, and I want to spend my life with you, can we get, can we shuffle off these kids somewhere, it doesn't work, you can't, it doesn't work that way, you can't have one without the other. So uh, Jesus commands us to keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. Uh, Hebrews um, 10.25, remember the Sabbath. Uh, do not give up meeting as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as we see the day approaching. You know, just uh, worshiping together. It's something that God expects, something that Jesus did, something that the Bible commands. And so if you say, I'm a friend of Jesus, but I just don't want to do what Jesus says, namely get together with other people on Sunday morning and worship, then you're not a friend of Jesus. Um, Lord's, the Lord's name in vain. Uh, all sorts of people said, yeah, I love Jesus, and then they turn around and use uh, his name in vain. Um, there's lying, there's lust, there's pride. I mean, you can talk about all sorts of things we can go through. But again, it's also important to note the difference um, between uh, works as an indication of salvation and works as a means of salvation. These things that we do, we don't do in order to be saved. We do them because we are saved. Um, the, you know, the obedience to God's commands do not save us. The obedience to God's commands indicates that we're already saved and that we're grateful for that salvation and we're living that salvation out. And, as a reminder, we're not living it out perfectly. Uh, so... Uh, again, sinners lapse, excuse me, sinners lo leap into sin and love it. Uh, saints lapse into sin and loathe it. 
So um, again, I think that really is a good model that we can fall back on to help new believers see and recognize this. Our, our, our obedience does not save us. Our obedience points to the fact that we are already saved. So important, important discussions you can have around this third question. Uh, fourth question is, if a person truly loves the Lord, what two things will they do with Christ's commands? And again, we're, uh, many claim to love Jesus, but not everybody who says that truly does. So Jesus in John 14, 21 says, Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So, how do we know who a true disciple is? A true disciple is one who has Christ's commands and keeps Christ's commands. Um, that's who, who loves Jesus. This is, again, reiterating the last point, but also clarifying it. To have a command means to know it, to be aware of it. So, if you're truly a follower of Christ, you'll want to know what he commands. You'll study his word, you'll want to know it. Uh, but knowing it is not enough. To keep his command means to do it. The way of expressing the love uh, to Jesus is through obedience. And by the way, disobedience is an expression of non-love. That's another way of saying hate. To, to not love someone is to hate them. And so when you disobey uh, Christ's command, you're expressing hatred for him. Um, you know, the Bible really, in this context, in this, this uh, area shows us what it means to love Jesus. Anybody can claim love, but if you're not obeying, you're actually not loving. I want you to think about an illustration uh, of a husband claiming to love his wife. And you may have seen this on TV, uh, on uh, fictional TV shows, or even like Cops, uh, you know, one of those shows, the reality TV shows, where a husband is claiming love for his wife but he repeatedly, repeatedly is cheating on her, uh, treats her poorly, maybe he's beating her and abusing her, and the wife sits there and she says, but he really loves me. And the husband's you know, separated by the police over there, he says, but I, I love her, I just lost, you know, I love her so much, she makes me lose control, I get so angry. Um, but that, and when you're watching that, what are you doing? You're shaking your head, no, saying, that's just so wrong. It's so twisted. That's not love. Those are empty words. That's uh, gutting the word love from all its meaning. Love is not shown in that way. Love is shown in some ways and not in other ways. And the Bible here clarifies the way that love is shown to the Lord. And namely that way is through obedience. So you can't Say, I love Jesus, but I'm just going to keep on disobeying him. I love Jesus, but I don't care about his commands. I don't really want to know what's in the Bible. I don't care to know what's in the Bible. If you love him, you'll want to know it, what he commands, and you'll want to do it. So the, that's, that's one of the ways we love Jesus. And that's one of the indications that we love him. That's one of the methods that we express our love to him. Why is it that so many are called? This is question five called converts or Christians, uh, excuse me, why is it that so many so-called converts or Christians never become true disciples of Christ? Um, and again, we could look back to the parable of the sower. You know, the seed is, thrown on the, is sown on the soil and it sprouts up quickly but then dies out or um, it lands on the, the path, but uh, the, the birds snatch it up. It's choked out. Um, you know, why is it that people, so-called Christians, never become true disciples of Christ, maybe just babies or infants or uh, just people who maybe make the, the claim to believe but never go much further than that. John 12, 42 uh, gives us some answer here and explains it. Nevertheless, uh, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So I see two reasons in this passage. One is fear, and the second is pride. I mean, 
they they were afraid of the fair they were afraid of the Pharisees, uh, and the, their fear was driven by their pride. They love the glory that comes with man. So fear and pride. How how are these manifested today? I think there's a lot of uh, Christians today, people who claim to be Christians, um, that are afraid. This is the fear part that people will think that they are too religious. They don't want to be labeled as a fanatic. Uh, they don't want their zeal for Christ to um, cause others to think that they're strange or weird. Now, these, these sorts of Christians don't mind being moderately devoted and being recognized as a believer, but they don't want to be thought of as a religious nut. Uh, they don't want to go too far, uh, so they kind of try to balance out um, and I'm not talking about like presenting, the, uh, you know, making sure that your life is balanced so that people are attracted to Christ. Uh, I'm talking about stifling what you feel the Lord leading you to do. So that, you know, biting your tongue when you, you're feeling the Holy Spirit prompting you to to speak up. Uh, I think we're afraid of how this will affect our lives in, in many ways, uh, our popularity, our uh, how people think of us, our social stature. Our work status as well, because this could uh, result in not getting a promotion, and therefore our income levels as well. And by the way, these are all true, actual, possible consequences of uh, speaking up for Christ and allow you know putting your faith on the line. The the real question then becomes, what is our priority in life? So. Uh, so we are called to be disciples. The The next thing, uh, and I'm hoping that that, that section really kind of cements that home, that uh, the the first section we defined what a disciple was. The second section we talked about uh, the fact that all Christians are called to be disciples, to be discipled by Christ um, and by others as well. But the third section here we're talking about is the fruitful disciple, namely that all disciples are also called to be disciplers. Um, we'll focus on the outcome of our connection with Christ, the consequences of discipleship, namely fruit. We are called to bear fruit. We are called to disciple others. Not only are we called to be a disciple, but we are called to disciple others. And the first question in the section is, uh, what can, excuse me, what can we in ourselves do for the Lord Jesus. What can we in and of ourselves do for the Lord Jesus? John 15, 5 answers this question. Jesus is speaking. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So what can we in ourselves do for the Lord Jesus? Nothing. It's that simple. If we are not connected to Christ, we can do nothing for Christ. We can do nothing to honor him. We can do nothing to glorify him. Now, that doesn't mean he can't use us. Uh, he can't use an unbeliever to bring out about his glory, but the unbeliever isn't doing it. Then it's the Holy Spirit doing it, the, that God's doing it. Uh, think back to um, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, he was not a believer, and yet God could use him. Uh, the Pharaoh in the Exodus, God was mightily glorified. It wasn't through Pharaoh, it was, uh, it was because of Pharaoh, but it wasn't uh, in a good way. It was Pharaoh was resisting him, and God was overcoming Pharaoh. So, uh, if we are to do something for Christ, if our intention is to honor Christ, uh, the only way that that can happen is when we are connected to Christ, and God will be glorified in all people. It says in the end, every knee will uh, bow, every tongue confess. Uh, believers, you know, I think this question is, you know, what can um, people do for Christ willingly? Uh, the, the willingly is the important part here. We bend our knee joyfully, willingly. We sing his praise joyfully, exultingly. Uh, the unbeliever uh, bends their knee because they are forced to bend their knee. They uh, declare his praise with much chagrin and resistance. They, they spit out his praise 
uh, they hate it. They don't want to declare it, but they can't help but declare it. So what can we do in and of ourselves for the Lord Jesus? Um, nothing without his work through us. So our connection with Christ, remember, is the thing that gives us direction. Uh, you know, you can say, I want to honor Christ today, and I'm going to do this thing. And I've heard different people say this who are unbelievers, and the thing that they were describing was the opposite of what would actually honor Christ. So, um, for instance, I heard people say, well, we have to love um let's let's uh use the the homosexual situation we have to love homosexuals and that means that we have to accept them for who they are well that's not doing anything in christ that's doing the opposite because it's it's advocating disobedience it's not truly loving someone because it's denying uh, the sin that is inherent in the disobedient homosexual lifestyle and so ultimately what is it doing for Christ it's doing nothing it's dishonoring Christ so the unbeliever in attempting to honor Christ on their own without knowledge of his commands or a willingness and a commitment to obey his commands uh, attempts to honor Christ and ultimately dishonors Christ and you can apply this to any of the other situations that we talked about before where uh, nominal Christians are failing to obey and honor Christ. So Christ, being connected with Christ, gives us direction. It also gives us strength, uh, encouragement, uh, focus. It touches us. Uh, it touches each and every one of our attempts to honor Him with uh, His power. It purifies our imperfect actions and perfects them through His perfection. So. Uh, good deeds, so-called good deeds done by unbelievers, are not fruit. In fact, oftentimes they're the opposite of fruit. Uh, they're poison. So, what exactly uh, is fruit in the believer's life? Uh, deeds, accomplishment, character developed that strengthen and build God's kingdom. See, own, things done for Jesus build his kingdom. They don't shrink his kingdom. They don't damage his kingdom. They don't attack his kingdom. And advocating things that are disobedience, that go against his word, uh, attack and uh, attempt to undermine his kingdom. So we can do nothing without Christ. Um, as you're talking to un, uh, new believers about this, this is something they may struggle with quite a bit because they can see people doing so-called good deeds all around them. But the real question is, are those good deeds done for the purpose of honoring Christ? Are those good deeds done in accordance with Christ's word? So this is uh, something that you may spend weeks talking about. And any of these questions, you could spend more than one session talking about, frankly. So what does the Good Shepherd promise to his sheep, uh, which he leads? In John 10, 14, it says, when he has brought out, and Jesus is speaking, he says, he's talking about the, the Good Shepherd. When he, the Good Shepherd, has brought out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow after him for they know his voice. So I see two promises here. One, the promise that he will go before them, they will follow him, of course, and two, that they will know his voice. So going before the sheep, I think this has to do, obviously, with leading them, but I think it also has to do with defending them. Think about a shepherd leading a flock. He protects them from predators. He leads them to good places, to places where they can find food and water and shelter when needed. So the good shepherd leads his sheep he goes before them and the second thing that he promises is that they know his voice i think there's a, a a sort of intimacy here that the sheep recognize know are comforted by that familiar voice i remember uh one time um when i was a teenager i was listening regularly i would drive to and from work to and from college I had a long drive. It was over an hour drive each way. And I would listen regularly to different uh, people on the radio. One of those was Elizabeth Elliot. And, uh, you know, I heard her stories each and every day. And I heard her, uh, you know, the, the way that she went back uh, to the jungles to share Christ and the powerful testimony that was to me uh, as, a, as a teenager. And then uh, one day, I got the chance to actually go and see her 
uh, it was 1996, um, and uh, she walked up on stage. This was the first time I'd ever seen her. I never looked her up online. I never saw pictures of her. She was much taller than I had anticipated, but she also looked kind of frail. Cause, uh, you know, I hear her voice, but I never saw her. And of course, she was getting up in age, and she came out on the stage, and she walked over to the microphone, and I, I just watched, sort of waiting with bated breath, just anticipating her, her words. And she began to speak, and just the tones of her voice brought tears to my eyes. And I literally started crying because I was seeing and hearing that same familiar voice that I had heard so often on the radio. And I was really blessed one day, years later, to actually get to meet her and talk with her face to face when I was in seminary. She came and spoke at our seminary and she was walking across the parking lot afterwards and I ran up to her and her daughter and uh, just introduced myself and thanked her for her ministry. Um, but that voice, that intimacy, we hear his voice, we know his voice. If we are used to hearing the voice of Christ, there's an intimacy there, a connection. And I think that that, um, that is a powerful thing, um, that relationship there. Um, and just knowing that voice. And it's a promise that he gives to his sheep that as we listen to his voice each day, uh, it becomes familiar, it becomes a comfort, sort of like a blanket wrapped around us. Uh, uh, just such an encouragement. So that's uh, one of the things as we disciple uh, others, we hear his voice and we are teaching them to recognize his voice as well. Fruit is the natural result of what? Question eight. Uh, again, we come back to the, the vine passage, John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. This time uh, we're focusing on this next part. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We already looked at the do nothing part. Now we're looking at the fruit part. Um, what Fruit is the natural result of what? Jesus says here, whoever abides in me and I in him. He bears much fruit. So there's this abiding aspect. Um, and abiding, we said, means living with. Uh, and abiding means to live with. Uh, and for this, we mean to be together, uh, to be connected, uh, to accept the command, to obey the command, to live cl in close proximity with, to share uh, residence with. So that the real question then becomes how? Do we live with Christ? He doesn't have a physical body, so we're not talking about how the disciples lived with him. Uh, how is it that we abide with Christ? Well, prayer is an important component of this. Speaking with Jesus, talking with him. Bible study is important. That's listening to his voice, learning his voice, hearing his voice. So that's the conversation. We speak to him and he speaks to us. That's conversation, interaction. Uh, fellowship with other believers, that's being part of his family. Remember, we're not rejecting the, the other children in the family as we are being married to Christ. And the Bible uses that uh, imagery uh, quite a bit as well. We are married to Christ and we are children of Christ. So we're, we're uh, the church is his bride and uh, the, the other Christians are his children. So we're in, in fellowship with other believers. Service is another way to abide in him, finding ways to serve others in his name and to his glory that draws us closer to him as he is pleased with our action. Uh, we feel that pleasure, uh, like Eric Liddell says in um, Chariots of Fire. When he runs, he feels his pleasure. When he does what he was designed to do, God designed him and, and built him to run and to run fast. And so uh, he feels God's pleasure when he does the things that he was designed to do. So when we serve others and love others, we feel his pleasure. Um, you know, there's lots of spiritual disciplines we could talk about. Fasting, uh, confession of our sins, uh, uh, evangelism and accountability, uh, all sorts of things that we can do as we uh, enter into spiritual disciplines of, of different kinds. Uh, and, and maybe we move through different kinds of spiritual disciplines depending on what season of life we're in. But uh, they ultimately uh, help us to stay close with Jesus. <clears throat> When Andrew met Jesus, what three things uh, did Andrew do? And again, this is a model for discipleship. Um, John 1.40 tells us 
one of the two who heard John speak, and John was pointing to Jesus, uh, followed Jesus. Uh, this One of these two that heard him speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him, at Peter, and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter or Rock. So what three things did Andrew do? This is the model of a disciple. Well, first of all, he followed Jesus. We talked about that in sections one and two. Secondly, he told another about Jesus. And in this case, it was his brother, Simon. So he went and told Simon about Jesus. So disciples tell other people about Jesus. And third thing, that uh, Andrew did was he brought Peter to Jesus. So we lead people to Jesus. We follow Jesus, we tell others about Jesus, and we lead them to Jesus. We do all these things. This is a, a the model for discipleship. Become a follower yourself and lead others and tell others about Jesus and lead them to him. You can tell somebody about Jesus if they're not interested. They're not going to follow you. They're not going to follow you to Jesus if they don't want anything to do with him. When you tell them, if you see an interest there, then you bring them. To bring them to Jesus, bring them to prayer, um, uh, pr help them to pray the uh, sinner's prayer of repentance and accept Jesus as their Savior. Bring them to church with you. Disciple them. You know this is what it means to bring somebody to Jesus. This is the model. Uh, where are we sent? John 17. Jesus says, uh, as he's praying to God, he says, "As you sent me into the world, so I have." sent them into the world. What does it mean to be sent into the world? What does it mean to go into the world? It means the, the world oftentimes in the Gospels indicates a pla the place where unbelievers are. It's the, the place where you find unbelievers, and, and frankly, you can find them anywhere, including in the church. Um, but at least in the church, we hope they're seeking and maybe being led by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit to um, uh, um, seek after Jesus. But um, so we go to wherever the unbelievers are uh, with the purpose of telling them why um, to bear fruit. John fifteen sixteen says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So the reason that we're going into the place where unbelievers are uh, is to bear fruit. Remember, we said we don't go to those places uh, that, that Jesus wouldn't want us to go to, that, that aren't edifying, that aren't building up Christ, unless there's a, a real purpose to transform a place like that. Um, and and to please don't think I'm recommending that we go to places like the ones I talked about earlier. Um, but wherever we go, where unbelievers are, we're going with the goal of bearing fruit. Um, and the fruit that we're talking about is fruit that lasts, fruit that should abide, fruit that lives, living fruit, you could say. Uh, fruit that lasts, living fruit, is transformed lives. Uh, that lasts. They live for eternity. When a, when a person comes to know Christ, they live forever and they abide so that's fruit that abides. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note here that this is the reason that God is answering prayer. It's because the disciple is producing fruit. Um, God it seems like God wants to answer prayer about making fruit. It says uh, you go to bear fruit and your fruit will abide so that so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. A lot of times we think of that, whatever he asks, and we have to struggle to think about, well, what does that mean? If I ask for the red sports car or to ask to win the lottery, well, is that bearing fruit? I don't think so. No. Oftentimes it will do the opposite. It will destroy our need and dependence on the Lord. And so um, when we're bearing fruit and our prayer is for fruit to bear, then God will answer that. A lot of times, though, that answer won't be like we want it to be. We say, Lord, I want to win the lottery so I don't have to work. I can go on the mission field. I can 
serve you 100% of the time. Uh, God may, uh, well, in all likelihood, not allow us to win the lottery, but will teach us to serve him joyfully, uh, even when we don't have enough money, and learn to depend upon him for his provision daily. That's one of the things the Israelites had to learn, was that God was the one that provided for their uh, needs daily. Um, Lord, your what does it say in the Psalms? Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A lot of times that light in the ancient days was nothing more than a, a bright candle. And so it wasn't like the headlights of a, a car shining out hundreds of yards ahead. Rather, it was a candle that, that just lit up the next step. And that's what God wants us to trust him with each step. And so he's not going to give us provision that's going to last for years that we no longer need to uh, rely on him. Uh, he's not going to magically just uh, give us win, a, win us the lottery. Uh, rather, he's going to teach us to depend on him and, and provide for our needs each step of the way. And that's going to give him much more glory. So when our prayer is about bearing fruit, I think God does answer it. That's just an interesting aside. But where are we sent? We're sent into the world. That's unbelievers. Why are we sent? We are sent to bear fruit, namely to tell others about Jesus and to bring them to him. The next question, 11, says, What two things are necessary for the care of those who are new in the faith? And we have two passages here. The first one, John 13, 1, says, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to this, uh, to the end. I think this is a picture of um, uh, commitment to love. He loved them to the end. It's a commitment to love all the way. And Jesus loved how he went all the way to the cross. Um, this, is, remember, is in the context. John 13 is in the context of the foot washing in the Last Supper. Jesus is uh, kneeling down, getting ready to kneel down and wash his disciples' feet, meet their needs, serve them, uh, humble himself, Elevate them, lift them up, encourage them, teach them, do what's needed for them. So he's sacrificially humbling himself and loving them. And by the way, this includes Judas Iscariot. Uh, he's serving them as they need to be served. He's loving them. And ultimately, we know that the end doesn't stop. The service doesn't stop with the uh, foot washing and the meal. It uh, it culminates at the cross that... Um, the cross is the ultimate act of sacrifice and love. So it's a commitment to love completely, totally, um, and entirely, um, without end. And then the second thing is uh, he's talking to Peter after the resurrection. Now, this is John 21. Peter has denied him three times, and Jesus is asking him three times, Do you love me? And uh, sort of re-establishing him as an apostle. And he says in John 21, 16, um, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Uh, tending sheep means to meet their needs, uh, leading them to places where they can be fed, helping them to find uh, shelter, protecting them from predators, caring for their needs, nursing them, when they're sick, uh, making sure that they're healthy. Uh, so tending sheep, that, that's a really beautiful picture of discipleship. Uh, so that, that is what we as disciplers are called to do. And every uh, Christian is called to be a uh, discipler in, in uh, one sense or another. We are called to help others to find Christ, to lead them to him, and to help them to grow in Christ. So disciple them. Tend the sheep. So to love and be committed to and to tend, meet the needs of. Uh, question 12. How may uh, we be treated if we follow our Lord? This is really important. John 15, 18, to, to help a new believer understand this is uh, uh, essential, or else they you know, that this could cause somebody to wander and stray quite far. John fifteen eighteen. If the world hates you, 
know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, be therefore the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So make sure, I mean, obviously, I'm sorry, skip the answer. <laughs> how, how may we be treated if we follow the Lord? Well, the world will hate us and persecute us. That's what we can expect as Christians. So this is something that's really important to make sure that a new believer understands. They need to be prepared for this attack, this onslaught. The devil is going to uh, rile the world, unbelievers, against believers in every opportunity he can. He will lead them um, to be rejected, and uh, you know, unbelievers will attack. Uh, and, and, and by the way, this includes friends and even family. People who have uh, lived their lives as unbelievers have established relationships where their friends and family are content and happy that this person is not a believer. They're not bringing guilt and shame uh, into their lives. They're not shedding light into their, onto their evil acts, their selfish acts, their unbelieving acts. And when a person becomes a believer, it's like a light has come into the room and now all of that which is wrong in their lives can be seen. And so they're gonna hate that, they're gonna reject it. It's important that new believers understand this and recognize that this will happen so that they can be prepared for it and not be shocked by it and so that they will continue to love the people even in the midst of this rejection so that they will know that it's not them that are being rejected but the Lord that they have committed their life to who is being rejected it's Jesus that's being rejected through them so yeah spend a good deal amount of time talking about this with a new believer so that they understand it maybe even give some examples in your own life of times when you've uh, faced difficulties, persecutions because of your faith. Um, and the last question has a couple parts to it. Uh, what happens to everyone who does not accept Christ as Savior? John 3.18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So they're condemned. And John 8, 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So what happens to anyone who does not accept Christ as Savior? They're condemned, and they uh, will die in their sins. What does that mean? Hell, in a word, damnation, eternal suffering. This is a, a, a challenging notion for a lot of new believers to accept that people, you know, friends, family, who don't know Jesus are uh, condemned and will die in their sins and spend eternity in hell. Uh, it's something that, that people don't want to accept. Even believers don't want to, uh, long-time believers struggle with this sometimes. But... It's very clear. It's not ambiguous at all. The Bible's clear that if we don't accept Jesus, we spend eternity in hell away from him. So one of the real questions you have to make sure at this point is, do, does the person you're discipling believe this? Do they accept this? Um, hopefully the answer is yes. If not, then of course the follow-up question is why? Uh, why don't they? Um, so, uh, it really points to a deeper problem here if they don't believe it. Um, all of our questions, we have to remember, are much more than simply academic ones, and this is no exception. It's not just about getting uh, the right theology into someone's head, but cultivating the right attitude and the right actions that, that follow suit. Uh, whether they believe it or not, uh, whether they believe this or, or don't believe it, it's very telling about their view on Scripture. Uh, one can claim to believe in the Bible, but if they dismiss passages like this that they don't like, 
And the truth is, they really don't believe in the Bible. They only believe in parts of it. This is tantamount to idolatry. In essence, it's creating a God in our own image. Um, I had uh, a pastor one time tell me that, um, that they didn't believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. I, I was flabbergasted, um, but it revealed to me that they really aren't a Christian. This pastor was not a Christian. They were a pastor of a church, but they were not a believer. They were not a Christian because the Bible is very clear about this. That's why Jesus died. That is the whole point of his death on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can be made right with God. So that pastor, however, had dismissed that part of the Bible. And it revealed to me that she didn't really accept the Bible. I had another time an elder whose son was gay uh, didn't accept the passages condemning homosexual behavior. And uh, they proceeded to tell me that they believed in the Bible. And it was very clear to me that they believed in only the parts that they agreed with. Um, so if somebody is uh, unwilling to accept a piece of the Bible, it shows us that they are unwilling to accept the Bible. Because the Bible is something you take all or you take nothing. If you take pieces of it, then essentially you're writing your own Bible creating your own God, establishing your own religion, and it's idolatry. You've rejected God. So this is um, so important to understand um, and make sure that the new believer understands as well. And what you believe about it will affect the second part of this question. Have you personally witnessed to anyone about the Savior in the past 30 days? So um, whether or not a person is eager to share their faith in Jesus, eager to share the gospel with another, with others, reveals a lot about their understanding of sin and salvation, uh, whether they accept the passages we were just talking about or not. Um, if um, if you have a friend who does not yet believe, and you love that person, and you believe what the Bible says about unbelievers, then you will be anxious to see them saved. You will be anxious to tell them about Jesus. And, and by anxious, I don't mean worried. I mean eager. Uh, you will want them to hear the gospel. You will want them to understand what Jesus has done. You will want them to believe so that you can be with them in heaven forever. Uh, you'll, you'll hate the idea of them dying in their unbelief and suffering in hell. Uh, see, if a person is blasé about spreading the gospel, it suggests that they don't fully understand it, or perhaps they don't fully believe uh, in the eternal ramifications of unbelief. Namely, they don't believe in the passages we just read. They don't believe that people are going to hell. So this question about have you personally witnessed to anyone about the Savior in the past 30 days just indicates uh, your level of um, desire. Uh, it's, it's an indicator. How, you know, how eager are you to share in this gospel, uh, to share the gospel with others? So, um, sin... As we think about this, uh, this desire to spread the gospel, this uh, yearning to share the hope of Jesus with others, we don't always do it. Why? Well, sin, ignorance, laziness, fear, pride, they can all keep us from consistently sharing Jesus with others. Um, if a person has been fruitless, uh, it's time to confess it. If, if we've been fruitless, if we've not produced fruit, now is a great opportunity, and this is in uh, Chet's conclusion, to uh, confess it, ask Christ to forgive us, and to point out 
those who need to hear about him because they're around us friends they're there are people all around us who need Jesus. Uh, it's not just those who live in the missionary field. They recognize it. I think sometimes we forget and uh, we just go about our business. But uh, if we truly had the, the heart of Christ, we would see people around us uh, all the time wallowing in hopelessness and despair, uh, spiritual despair and emptiness. Uh, fruit, bearing fruit, is the thing that comes out of life. It's the daily overflow of our connection with Christ. It's the, the natural uh, result of spending time with Jesus in prayer and in Bible study. <clears throat> so our passage today um, points to this as God's children. Um, our desire should always be to please him, to honor him, to obey him, to, love, to express our love to him through that obedience. The only way to honor him is to do what he says, and that is to obey his commands. Uh, that's what his commands are. That's what his Bible is. It's a guidebook to loving and honoring him. He wrote it down so that we would know how to love him and how to honor him, how to abide with him, how to live with him. So our memory verse today is really a prayer asking God to help us to become that which he wants us to be and what we want to be, uh, servants that please their master, children that a father can be proud of. And it comes from 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Father, as we look for the opportunity to disciple others. Continue to teach us and train us. Help us to grow so that we can best be prepared to help others to move to more, excuse me, to, to walk more in your footsteps. Father, to honor you through joyful obedience and submission to your will as you revealed it in your word, both the written word, the Bible, and the living word your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you for uh, joining me tonight, and God bless you, and have a good night.